There we go. Hey, welcome back. My name is Steve Jaguer. And I'm Mike Foster. Today we got an action-packed episode, reinforced postmortem. Uh, we're talking the Acorn application just came out and a cube green demo at the end of the show. Welcome. Say that three times fast. Yeah, reinforced no, post mortem. <laughs> reinforced. <laughs> that was hard. I'm glad I didn't, I didn't have to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, so anyway, uh, how have you been, Michael? You, you sound <laughs> ill. Yeah, I'm not uh, not doing too great. Um, coming back from a cough, I think it had to do with the two weeks of pretty much constant travel. But reinforced was a ton of fun. It was good to see everyone. Uh, it just knows how to throw parties. Slash yeah. events. Yeah, that is without question. It was good. Uh, just just in terms of structure, the venue was good, easy to get to. Uh, yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was pretty okay. We're gonna dive straight into reinforce. Yeah, we might as well talk that. about it yeah, before we get into yeah, the yeah. general news. So, good point. I, I thought super well organized. I we had a very good time at that. What was that? What was that venue next to it? That on lawn on D or something? Yeah, lawn on D. What does that mean? What's the D? It's on D Street. So there's D E Street, right? In South Boston. Everything is grid pattern. Yeah. So you're on D Street. Uh, so Lon okay. on D. Ton of fun. Uh little batting cage there and everything. It was good. Yeah, of course you like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. Where you where you wowed all the all the you know, I call it geeks trying to hit a ball and you went in there and just about killed the guy like with working the machine. Yeah, I think I hit one out of the net actually at one point. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that was pretty sweet. I would say if I had to play uh, devil's advocate, was my voice crackling? Yeah, that's my phone. Go ahead. Oh, okay, it was. Um, it was that some of the talks. All right, so and I'm I'm channeling someone else's a, a perspective here as well, and that was it was only only the second reinforce, which I missed the first one. Um, but he was the first one and he said AWS set a high standard on the first one where they they basically drop the, you know, as they do at reInvent, drop the whole lot of pretty cool security things. Mm -hmm. And this one was lackluster by comparison, right? Some of their keynote announcements where we were kind of like, nah, you know, mm -hmm. I guess I'll go check that out. It was definitely under attended or felt like it was because a lot of the, it was just super easy to get into and there was a lot of space. So I, I like that, but that's not necessarily great. And then while I found some of the commercial talks, like as sponsored talks, which I normally avoid like the plague, were actually pretty, pretty good because they seemed a bit paranoid about being self-promotional. Mm -hmm. Some of the AWS talks diver, diverged it were straight into, and now you get these AWS services. Yeah. So 
it was, wasn't i'm yeah. being pretty critical by saying that but it was an aws event for sure and it definitely yeah. uh <laughs> it felt under yeah. especially the second day the first day i think it was packed the second day uh it just didn't feel as bustling but it really was different wasn't it yeah very different uh, attendance on the second day i didn't know this, but I heard that it was supposed to be in a different state. It was supposed to be in Texas or Austin. They moved it because of political reasons or something like that, which yeah. could be one of the reasons, right? I mean, you have vendors. They're not really sure you're moving it around. You have to book flights. You have to book all this stuff. And maybe they just shrink the amount of people that they send because of it. So just from a company yeah, standpoint, you can kind of understand why that happens. Um, yeah. That makes that, sense, actually. That being said, everything around in, in Boston Seaport is super nice. So all of the after parties and you know partnerships and all those events were really, really well done. Well, that we might as well show it before we get into general news because it's it's there. So well, uh part of the reason why is Steve found this. I'm not sure who showed this to you, Steve, well, but so this was uh uh sent to be you actually met Janet. Janet does a lot of our uh, production work. She runs her own company and um, pinged me and said, oh, look at this. I was like, what? So like, if this is where we were, you click through on reinforce and you get every, this is unofficial. I mean, it's maybe not clear up there. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Unofficial. I don't know who manages this, but they have their own Twitter. See if you want to find out new things. Tequila and taco fix. Where's that? I don't know. But at the AWS Summit in Anaheim. Yeah. So we the first day you're there, we're like, oh, okay. And there was ours, DevSec party. We were there on the first night. But then after that, you could like look how many things. Yeah, it was a ton. This was the second day. Maybe it was why uh, there was a lot less people at the event the, the following day. Well, <laughs> I mean, a little too much. If you if you have to distribute all every attendee across all of these, it's like okay, yeah, that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it was nuts, and then even the like the last day, most people are going home, so it's a bit light. But that that I just thought was kind of mind blowing. And I'm of course I'm off to Black Hat next week, so you know I have already clicked on this one and gone through because Black Hat and B sides and DEF CON all go back to back. So even though this says black hat it has a lot of cool other things on it and that's oh. nuts it started to make me think that gosh if this website this website is designed primarily for aws events even though it has non-aws events in it um but if you were clever and if other non-aws or non-tech events have this level of spread across parties you could probably move to las vegas as a homeless person <laughs> And just oh, live just off party hop. Parties. Yeah. <laughs> and just party hop. Because like yeah. you can sign up for any of these. Or if you want to become a really good golfer, there's a top golf every night, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. But overall, yeah. does that mean we're getting the uh, the live black hat update next Friday? The live from Black Hat. Well, see, that'll be Black Hat. No. So B sides is um, I think it's Tuesday, Wednesday. And then that overlaps with a bit of Black Hat. And then DEF CON starts on Wednesday. But DEF CON goes until Sunday. Okay. It wraps. So on Friday, I'll be at DEF CON. I think I even have a... It's a sponsored talk, but it'll be good. Uh, talk. So I don't know. Because my time zone is going to be eight hours off. It'll be... Yeah, it'll be 8 a.m. in Las Vegas. If, so if you there's wanted a, to the show, but oh, we'll I talk can, about I, it anyways. I think it, it would be cool. It would be cool. Let's look at what conference parties are on the Thursday <laughs> and to figure out what state I'll be on the Friday, and then, then we'll decide. There All may right. not be a show next week. We'll see. We'll see. But let's get into the uh, the general news. Number one, a lot of videos, actually almost, though. almost, almost still on theme. Mm -hmm. uh, for CloudSec was the uh, prefix, let's say, to AWS reinforce last week. Uh, staged on the Monday, it also had to shift because of the move from location to location, and kind of stay on its feet. And, and here it is, all the videos. 
most of the videos, I should say. There were a few videos that were what they call Chatham House rules or whatever but in the UK, meaning you're not allowed to say what you see here. So a little bit of advanced preview notice. But yeah. most of them are here. And they're all in this list. And this list is down below in our show notes. So if you want to watch uh, CloudSec Virtual, the comments we had, I think, I think we met the, um, Kevin Paul uh, from one of the attendees at for CloudSec the first night at the, the party. Yep. And he said, one of the most educational one day events I've ever been to. Nice. Yeah. I applied to get in and didn't get in. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a ticket and I didn't get a, a paper in. But I agree. I mean, the industry generally re highly regards for CloudSec. So if you're a cloud security professional, here is probably 22 videos a day of your life that uh, about 20 minutes each. So, you know, take a day, watch the ones that are relevant to you because a lot of them are usually pretty cutting edge. Very true. You know, and uh, next we got a little bit more technical of a article. Yeah. This one was posted by solo.io. I came across it and back up. yeah, you back up. I wanted to get uh, your thoughts because you know a little bit about solo. So maybe a little background. Yeah. Well, when you added it, I thought Cilium layer seven capabilities compared to Istio. And we have made no, I don't know. We haven't hidden the fact that we think Istio is heavy. Sidecars are a bad idea. Uh, and we've been kind of, well, let's see, fans at a distance from. I wouldn't say bad concept. idea. It's a heavy architecture. It's tough. It's it's unwieldy. It's tough for anything <laughs> except for maybe somebody who's been in Kubernetes for three to four years, what? right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just well, saying technologically impossible. There's there's always a, a use case, right? I don't want to just say uh, Blake. From a security perspective, bad. sidecars are kind of an anti pattern. But anyway, yeah. it's probably is a good idea, but. So comparing Istio to Cilium, and I have not seen Cilium Mesh yet. I think it's something we should really try and demo on the show at mm -hmm. some point or get a guest on to do. So I was great. I thought I want to see a layer seven capability comparison to Istio and it's long. Like how deep into this did you get? Yeah, I mean, the, the I feel like the JSON and YAMLs and all that really kind of added to the length of the article, but it was true. pretty interesting. I think they're trying to outline exactly how to get layer seven uh, with Cilium and Envoy as well. So it's a little right. bit of both that you have to configure. And then the alternative is using MTLS with a sidecar architecture. I, I think it's it's somewhat trying to justify the reason why you have a sidecar architecture and MTLS, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. More than it is showcasing Cilium or anything like that. Uh, there definitely is a little bit of overlap. So it's it just kind of showcases, I think, honestly, the challenges of both. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest yeah that's if you fair, want uh, layer seven and you want some sort of authorization and authentication at the same time yeah i think so well the, so the reason which i haven't said yet i was curious was i i went through looking nitpicking let's say for any kind of bias because because solo i think solo is kind of a competitive product to what would be cilium mesh because they're at, well, let me just do this here. Like this is so, written by a solo employee. And if I, let's see if this adds up. I clicked on this. There we go. Yeah, Aha, built on Istio and Envoy. Built, Box, yeah. Built for Kubernetes. Yeah. So there you go. I thought, and I thought, well, certainly, surely Cilium Mesh is a competitive uh, thing. I don't know, but maybe maybe it's collaborative. Maybe it's competitive. It just seemed a bit competitive. So I, I thought I'd see. It didn't actually come across as biased though. Let me just say that. Yeah, it was well done. I think it just kind of yeah. outlined the the differences between the two and how the, the setup issues. Yeah. Why the architectures are the way they are. Um, yeah, overall, pretty good. I think we're mm -hmm. going to see more and more Cilium versus in the service mesh wars continue to heat up post 2018. I remember when that was the hot topic. So, yep. Service mesh wars. <laughs> yeah. That's All right. Uh, next thing we have well. Sig StoreCon. Well, you know, let's get on top of the, the latest and greatest buzzwords. Sigstore, Cosign, all of that. That this this so this is a recently announced day zero event for KubeCon NA uh, happening on October 25th. CFPs open if you happen to be a Sig Store person. Uh, word on the street is that they are looking for user stories. So when I say user stories, I mean like, are you trying to use any of Sigstore? What what are your challenges? 
what are the hiccups? Does it work? Does it work? Are you trying it in languages that it's not designed out of the box for? Uh, they want to hear about it. So and they really like open source stories too. So you yeah. can't just come in and say, hey, we're doing this internally with our private <laughs> paid for service. Well, they want things like, you know, obviously six or recore, um, cosine. How are you implementing it? Right. Totally. Well, well, the reality is that they probably would welcome a talk or two because there you can implement recore internally. Yep. You can create but, this yeah, be like why? Project. Yeah, it, it would be if you had an interesting tale around that, I'm sure they'd want to see it. And you know that so, in two years, once all of the startups that I just saw at open, um, uh, open source summit actually start to implement their paid products and paid supply chain products, then they're going to be infiltrating into that con probably in a couple of years. Seems oh, yeah. to be the general growth trend, right? Yeah. Either way, though, I mean, I'm signed up for the secure con again the two days mm -hmm. before. But I'm a little torn because I am playing with this is a security product and I am playing with it. And it's like, OK, can I do half and half? Does it cost anything? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Is it one of the free day zero events? In which case I don't believe it is. It's on the Tuesday. Um, yes. How native security con is the Monday, Tuesday as well. So there's a little bit of overlap there. Mm. Um, typically, only the very popular events get to extend to Monday. Yeah, it's a one day or. Yeah, and it's three hundred and seventy nine dollars to go. All right, <laughs> submit a CFP, get a yeah. talk, get, get your company to sponsor you. Can. Yeah, heck yeah. Okay, I guess this is the last general news one. Yep, it's been a little it's bit of a, a splash this week. Yeah, I saw it announced that in several places, mm -hmm. but I came kind of straight to the introducing Acorn. Um, combined efforts. Now, there's a third person involved in this, but it's the, it's basically the rancher founders. There's Darren. Darren Shepard wrote this. Uh, I just clicked on his name by there's, accident. I did not mean to do is that. It Shen? Yeah. Right. He was one of the original founders of Docker. He was the CEO. He was the he was CEO of Rancher. Yeah. 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 But uh, he also was helping out with Docker. I think originally. Oh. Okay. Anyways. Yeah. I, uh, so th that that's funny because all of a sudden there was news about him leaving rancher obviously a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago yeah. that uh came up in chat uh and so this was obviously the next project and what and so, oh, here's where i'm going to fall down an application packaging deployment framework for kubernetes yeah what does that mean <laughs> uh it means you have to learn a new language <laughs> yeah uh oh, really it's, it's just about I think it's trying to abstract away the fact that if you need to, let's say you want to create a deployment in Kubernetes and you want to, you know, have it on a port. Well, you can go serverless and you can go through a UI and Google or something like that. Or if you're a developer, maybe you just need to imp implement a couple specific features. And then in the back end, Acorn is going to automatically generate all those manifests for you, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, I just need this port. I just need this. I just need this. All right. Well, that's all we really need. You can upload it all as one artifact, I think was also the big thing. So not only can oh, right. you, you can upload it kind of the Docker file, it's an acorn file. Obviously, we need something new. Um, it comes with the configuration with the Docker file, and you can sign all of that together so that when it goes into the cluster, your configuration is always the same. So if your ports change, well then technically, you know, that would also be an issue if you're doing any sort of um uh like uh, signature verification as well. So yeah, a little so bit more the verification. Yeah, so it's kind of skipping a little bit of the operator step and allowing developers to basically create their application as code and deploy it to Kubernetes. Oh, then I like it. Yeah, it's an interesting, it solves a couple interesting problems. So um, yeah, it just it's another layer of abstraction that's taken away. And if you look at it, so it below is a simple hello world. You can kind of see this. You have, let's say your Docker file, you, you're going to import your, specific application code and then you're going to say well i want these specific environment variables i want these specific things that's all going to be wrapped uh put into artifact hub and then when you want to deploy it it's basically just like a deploy that container right yeah and that's and then all of the uh um you know network policies all of the different objects in the back end are going to be configured so pretty cool hmm okay would i how far off would i be if i said we're kind of shifting the operator model left. Is that 
yeah, that's I, not I, quite right. But I, I no, I mean, I think it's I think it's valid. There's there are, there are obviously use cases, especially smaller use cases, where Kubernetes can do everything, and you want to take the power of Kubernetes, but you don't want the overhead of having a massive operations team doing everything all the time, right? So you can get a something like this to say, "Hey, listen, I'm an op, I'm a Kubernetes operator. I'm just going to put some frameworks around the namespaces, but at the end of the day, you're just going to go and deploy into this namespace, and you can do it all there. It can all be signed. I don't even have to touch anything. All I'm going to do is put guardrails up, and that way you." To me, it's kind of like a silo effect, but it also allows developers to control everything about their application where they deploy it, right? And there are going to be those yep. use cases. Yep. So, um, you know, is it an anti-pattern? It's. I feel like it's not DevOps. I feel like it's kind of the opposite of it in a way. Is but it? It, de okay, it depends why? on it depends on how it would be built into the process, right? Like you're giving the developer all the tools and power to go and deploy into Kubernetes. Somebody still needs to manage Kubernetes. Somebody still needs to go and check to make sure that the ports and all that stuff is configured properly. So you mm -hmm. you're still going to be setting up rules at the operator level, even though you're giving the developer all this power and configuration aspect. So to me, and if you look at the example that uh, Darren wrote down, it was he wanted to deploy a Minecraft server into Kubernetes and all that stuff. It's like yeah, that that works when you're like the admin of your own Kubernetes cluster, but giving Acorn to, let's say a company with 10,000 people, you know, I think you might run into some scaling issues because at the end of the day, you're still gonna need the operator there, the operations team yeah. to go and set guardrails, right? So I think yeah. it would have to, it would have to kind of be paired up. And I think this is why you sort of saw Rancher spin it off because they're gonna do, here's your multi-cluster management, here's your policy enforcement, and then they're gonna tie it in with Acorn. And then they're gonna say like Acorn, has this configuration your policy has this and then you can break it before the deploy phase right so yeah. if you tie it in that way it's pretty good um mm -hmm. but again it just needs that integration i think before for the full the full story to be told so where's the money if this is a company uh that's a good question i mean you're gonna have to prove all you have to prove that it's better than the existing model right and and mm -hmm. you have to do it fast because in the next two yeah. years i think you're seeing a lot of GitOps products and uh DevSecOps shift left story that that's maturing now. So you got to do it quickly and then you got to integrate with some of the other products if you want to really sell it. The other thing too is if it's a spinoff of Rancher, it could be one of those things where Rancher invests into a company and then buys it back for cheaper. Oh, right? yeah. So maybe they don't give a, a, a crap about competing. <laughs> maybe they don't. <laughs> they just want to do it outside of Rancher's or Suse's uh, and say guardrails as a company. Yeah. Uh, either way, I think it's really yeah. I, interest. It's an interesting idea, and um, Darren Shepard is an insanely smart guy. So oh, yeah. I wouldn't that dare question. Team. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> nuts. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm sure they'll be successful in some form, for in, sure. at a bare minimum, yeah. more successful than anything I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, uh, all right. I think that's it for the general news. We're on to the crazy stuff. Let's hit it. Um, yeah all right but, some starting with some common sense yeah i came across <laughs> this one and i just you know that the title was meant to look at a start a little bit of controversy here plain kubernetes secrets are fine i was like what? we just spent the last two years talking about storing kubernetes secrets encrypting them <laughs> using something like a kms like a vault right yeah. to manage your secrets but they do make a good point because Really, if your etcd is encrypted and you're storing Kubernetes, you're going to have your variables injected into memory at runtime, right? Yeah. So if somebody has access to the container, they're going to have access to your secrets. So really, we should be preventing container access and um, container breakouts and things like that. Because at the end of the day, you can use a KMS. It doesn't matter. It's going to be there in memory at runtime, right? Right. right. Correct. Now, I don't think you... What's the excuse? You throw out the baby for the bathwater? I forget what the the example is, but I, you know, you could still do both, <laughs> and they do mention it, but um, it's just kind of a an interesting point, I think, where you should be encrypting, but it's not necessarily the be all to end all. I think there's other things that you can do first if you're just starting off in Kubernetes to make sure that uh, your computer is or your uh, Kubernetes cluster is, let's say, protected or hardened, right? I don't know if you have any thoughts on this or if you read it, but it made a good point. I think the number one thing, obviously, is making sure etcd is encrypted at rest. I think that's the bare minimum. It's 
yeah making sure that your That's node can't be accessed right because mm -hmm. i mean that that is the other thing is if you have a kms and it's not on the node let's say it's uh located somewhere somewhere else as a service like you have um what vault on aws well then you, mm -hmm. you don't really necessarily have to worry that much about node. well you still have to worry but it's less of an issue about uh, if somebody breaks into the node because the secrets aren't stored there they're injected in the memory at runtime so there's going to be a little bit more of a an escalation issue but again the other point that they make is if somebody's breaking into the node secrets access is probably the least of your worries if somebody's getting in there with privileged access right yeah so um it, it's kind of a they're basically trying to sh say that it's a small attack vector it's smaller than a lot of people think which okay all right i tend to agree with i think the misconfigurations are probably going to be your number one issue right definitely uh so it's kind of it's not necessarily, yeah, the headline's inflammatory. Plain Kubernetes secrets are fine. But the reality is, before people started, I don't know, becoming overcautious on plain Kubernetes secrets, and going, ah, it's just base 64, oh my god. That's because everybody was jamming everything. And, and now the reality is we can just cool down a little bit, right? Yeah. I think we can, it's okay to use some Kubernetes secrets. And I think that, I think actually it's pretty well written. Like in my, my, in my glance, I like that they do the little threat model, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. And it's a super short article, which I'm always a fan of. Yeah. Yeah. They outline kind of the, the four or five ways that you can get access to secrets and then say, here yeah. are the realistic mitigations that you can take. Yeah. But again, like it, it's stored in memory at runtime. So if somebody has access, they have privilege access, they have kubeadmin access. You know, really, it's the service accounts and IAM roles and misconfigurations that I think are going to be your biggest yep. threat to secret exposure. Yep, I think, I think it's fair. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. good, uh, good perspective. Now, another crazy news. It's actually this could probably be a big spender, but uh, Robinhood got fined again. Oh, why don't I have that one up? Uh, maybe because I changed it, but I do have it here. All right, all right. You, you can throw it up there. I my next one was a, a certain social media platform. Yes, I'm not shocked by that one, but I think we <laughs> we know exactly what uh, platform it's going to be. But yeah, Robinhood's crypto division fined 30 million. Whoa! Let me zoom in here. Which to them is what like uh, 10, 10 pounds. Yeah, something like that. But <laughs> significant failures in areas of anti-money laundering and cybersecurity regulations. One of the issues was it was inadequately staffed. Ooh. So this is the first crypto sector enforcement. This is the first time that uh, uh, they've been enforcing it. And this is always kind of my worry about blockchain and really crypto in general is they're not really going to go after the crypto, but they're going to go after everybody that's pulling and investing into crypto right it's mm -hmm. the you can go and make a ton of money on bitcoin but you have to pull it out somewhere so who do you pull it out through how do you pull it out right that's that's what the government's going to go after so yeah i just they said that they didn't crack down enough on fraud and it's like well isn't that inherent to the blockchain that there is like, i don't know i just fraud. yeah i'm like they just didn't really expand on it anyways i thought that was uh kind of a, a big uh, a big gut punch and so far they're down five percent since august 2nd they're down five percent today so now's a good time to buy robin hood robin hood because like uh, the first time i ever heard the the phrase hype cycle was when equifax plummeted uh after their hack and they're they're back higher than they were at the time you know maybe not now because there's a bit of drop but they went they went way down then then way back up so all it did was create a great buy opportunity because everybody forgets was it buy the Stupid fear humans. sell the hype i forget what the expression yeah. is right like right now yeah everyone's afraid so everyone's selling so there'll be a point where skeptical worth buying robin hood stock well this company is still doing pretty well oh yeah so you got all right you're you're taking over <laughs> Well, yeah, it's All right. your, your yeah. screen, though. It's my screen. Yeah. But uh, TikTok. Now, this for anyone that this comes as a shock to, come on. Unacceptable security risk and should be removed from app stores. 
I mean, this isn't the first time there's been an article about TikTok. Like what TikTok was one of the first ones where um, I don't know if we had this on our show, but there was a list of apps across all apps that automatically scraped your clipboard because your clipboard is designed to cross between applications. Mm -hmm. So if you ever like last passed, got your password and then took it into your app and pasted it, TikTok was, yep, thank you very much. Yep. And TikTok was the only one on the list that I I saw that was like, this is a major application. The rest of them were like all these weedy little whatever applications. So what a surprise. Yeah, they have. I know when you uh, when you download an app and it asks for all of your security permissions and all this stuff, it basically lists out that it takes every single piece of your phone's data, including like all your photos are getting exported. As soon as you give it access to your photo library, they're all gone. <laughs> It's, I'm just I'm shocked that anybody still downloads it. But uh, it's funny uh, when I came across this on Reddit, the first comment was, "Yes, I tell people this, and they don't care." Yeah, yeah. You I know. mean, where Sometimes. would where would where would the floss as a dance be if it weren't for TikTok? <laughs> I think that's more Vine. Floss as that's so old, isn't it? That yeah. it's actually Vine. That's yeah. so my age. Vine was the the original TikTok. It just didn't have. I think the cameras weren't as good. It didn't have the filtering yet, and the music rights weren't there. So it was like it's before its time. Yeah. Anyways, clear well, use of un <laughs> unclear use of collected data. So is it worse on Android? Does it say whether it's worse on Android than Apple? I don't know. It must be right. Yeah, because Apple has in implemented some pretty significant security features. So like, if you go in, it's, yeah. you want to give access to all photos or just this photo, right? It's pretty. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty good with that, but all right. Should we spend some money? I just put that out there. A little bit yeah, of agreement from the, <laughs> yeah. from the crowd. I, I like the fact that before we before we jump in, let me just pop this. Just the just the headline is TikTok a sophisticated surveillance tool? We can kill it off right away. But just the fact that the questions there is like yes. Well, um, who makes TikTok? Not even sophisticated. <laughs> It's an it's an obvious surveillance tool. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it's I'm just shocked by it. They they basically came out just side note before Big Spider. They've came out and said that their whole point is eventually these people who are on TikTok doing these things are going to be senators, CEO, business people, and it's just become a data war where you have to leverage it. On the other side, socially, it's going to be very interesting when everybody and let's say their their grandmother has not flattering pictures of them being posted or blackmailed when you get older. So are we going to stop Ooh. caring as a society? It's like, ah, they did that when they were 12. But I don't know, the culture doesn't uh, really like that right now. Anyways. Uh, one more of those. One more. We can't move to the money yet. Yeah, yeah. There's this one. Oh, yeah. That's right. It's not. Uh, Admit this one in. Well, this is a recent admission. And for some reason, I thought they'd admitted it like four years ago. I don't know. I don't know. Is, is this a different thing or is it the same one? Uh, looks like the same one. Maybe there was like a, they admitted fault and then there was the whole penalties process and that got delayed probably a couple of years because of COVID. Right? Like it probably happened. They knew that it happened and then it was, okay, well, what's the rectifying situation? I don't know. I, I feel like the last two years were pretty, they just flew by. So maybe that yeah to do with the that, delay. maybe that's the problem because i thought the ceo is now gone yep or, or that's the current okay yeah, yeah yeah but it's like they just churned through management after that it was crazy like they were a pay off the baddies delay the hack it's like everything on the everything to do with what uber did there is kind of like why gdpr exists yep it's like they go like right, because this is what companies do this is what they do this is why we need rules for sure. All right. Uh, time for the money. Let's spend some money. Boom. Number one. Uh, I don't have the article, but I've got the result. 
Island, the enterprise browser, you know what they got. What did they get? Let's see. What they got. 115 million in series B. Another one of these ones. Had you heard of them before? Yeah. No. Wow. Oh, you had? No, oh, sorry. I never no, I hadn't heard of them before, but uh, I'm not shocked that they got that much money. Uh, when you look at basically the, just the day-to-day -day issues that I see. The browser isn't an enterprise application. So yep. it's a, a browser design. So this is trying to solve the fact that everyone's annoyed that the browser has so much power. Yep. It's basically an operating system that runs on your operating system. And it's one of the most single, most vulnerable parts of your running laptop or computer. Mm -hmm. And they've made, I guess, a secure browser, right? Is that the... Yeah, my one of my other things, too, is why is this coming out now? Is it just because, you know, Internet Explorer dominated for so long? Now they said they're not going to support it. So it's a little bit like there's market space now. Or is it the fact that, you know, most of it's built on Chromium, the package, right? Like Internet Explorer moved to Chromium. I think, I don't know what Safari mm -hmm. uses, but if the underlying packages are kind of all the same across different browsers, well, then you could use that, pull it from open source, create a uh, work-specific browser, right? I'm just kind of, from an engineering mm -hmm. standpoint, it's, uh, it's interesting why it's popped up now. It, yeah. Is it, well, there, there are lots of safe browsers out there. There's lots of browser, brow, I mean, if we, uh, we had a list of the number of browsers that you've never heard of, there's probably a good, good solid 10. But none of them have, let's just say, made it look so pretty. And it looks and feels and behaves <laughs> like the browser you're on right now. Built on Chromium. Same open source project. So it, here's the question. Is, do you think Chrome is chucking money into this? Google? Oh. That's my bet. Oh. So they benefit anyway. They benefit anyway. Uh, with Internet Explorer not being supported in places moving forward. Well, now the the internet browser for companies has kind of opened up because Internet Explorer was the typical one that would get pushed into all Microsoft accounts, right? Because, yeah. oh, you're on Windows, use Internet Explorer. Now that's gone. So opens up the marketplace. Now Chrome can come in, move their engineers over, make it so that uh, it's more lightweight and more organization specific, right? You don't need all these super heavy features if you're basically just running google g chat stuff right yeah mm, it's pretty good interesting yeah i mean who knows if it'll take off because <laughs> people have browsers already they're like yeah yeah they're very specific imagine trying to force a, a browser on a developer no uh, no way no yeah it, it just yeah but big companies horrible. will try yeah well i mean i guess i mean it's no plugins no advantages i don't know it seems like I think there will be the ability. I think it's more of an operator needs to go and enable them, right? Yeah. Like, do you need Honey in your browser for work or those different no. applications? No, and you don't want that data being shipped out. So it's like, okay, well, here, we'll give you all the features of Chrome, but we'll allow an operator that's in New York for your company to enable them for your entire company, right? Right, that's, you don't get to unicify your browser yeah. anymore. And we're going to force a security update if you don't. Like if, if I see a red update bar on the top of your Chrome, you, like you're getting shut down in 10 minutes if you don't update this, right? Yeah, that's when I worked at Synopsys because Synopsys was, even though we we're a security wing, majority of the company knew nothing about software and security. So we would get, we would have really over the top security measures enforced on developer laptops that just made it exactly. impossible. Yeah. to do anything right because they were the same measures were being enforced on the marketing intern or something yeah this sounds like apple's iphone lockdown mode big purple <laughs> question by <laughs> geek i don't know when um they, they gave yeah just wrote big purple and i was like are you referring <laughs> to synopsis because <laughs> it's very purple anyway should we go should we move on to the next one yes sir we have a little, not CV, but vulnerability thing. We have oh, one. wait, no. Oh. We, yeah, that's right. We have one more big spender. You, you found this one, yeah. um, which I thought was interesting, Parameter X. Human 
announce a market a market changing merger. Why is it market changing? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, everything's market changing. Yeah, well, really I, vague about it. I mean, human really is trying to develop, from what I understand, a more artificial intelligence approach to runtime security, authentication, and network security. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're taking an existing, say, agent and networking infrastructure and trying to bring that into humans. Uh, approach to security i think that that perimeter and packet filtering feature especially at the endpoints of wherever mm -hmm. your data centers are i think that's the most applicable place for ai it gets really yeah. really hard once you're internally because there's so much just organizational different like you bring somebody new on they don't understand it they send the cube exec into something and all of a sudden like they're kicked out they're, that's just you don't want a black box for that but at the end point it makes the right. most sense right yeah that's true that's true so I think that's probably the the whole point of this merger. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, there you yeah. go. You get, why is it merging? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Like, oh, here we go. Undisputed leader. That's mm. a lot. Probably that's disputed. Nice okay. Yeah, of course. We're not. How dare we dispute? <laughs> nice one. Okay, cool. That uh, that that'll be interesting to see where that develops. It's funny. Like on the on the back of this. I think uh, the CISO series podcast, the last subject of it was marketing versus lies or something. If you go look at the most recent podcast that it was, mm. and they had somebody on there, I think it was a representative of Sysdig or something. I don't want to stitch up Sysdig, but I'm pretty sure. Um, and she said that most lies in, in cybersecurity marketing are to do with the use of AI. Oh yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we all agree to that. One. I think yeah. I think zero trust is up there at this point. I saw well, yeah. we should have we were at when we were at Reinforce, we took a bunch of photos of the different oh, we were meant to do and that. what they're sending. We should post that. Anyways, well okay. We gotta come back for a WTF section in the future. All right. So leave it with me. I'll take the same photos at B Sides and DEF CON. So what we did essentially is we took photos of really terrible taglines. And I was gonna come back after Foster had forgotten and give you the tagline to see if you could remember the company. Oh, that would have been good. So I'll I have all the photos I took, and I'll take more in the next conference, and then we'll do it the week after. All right, special feature. Yeah, we'll put we'll put a couple of beers in line or something like that. <laughs> all right, cookie time. Now, what starts with the letter C? <laughs> All right, was there two or one? I was going to sneak another one in, but at the very least, there was. Now, I know we're being really flexible about CVEs, right? But this is a vulnerability that came out uh, 2021, let's say end of year. Um, it might even have been on the show. But it's not been fixed. And as, as far as I can tell, it doesn't still have a CVE associated with it because it's one of those ones that's like, it's not a single product problem yeah it's a system level problem yeah well it was I, I, we were at a couple of talks too at reinforce where they were specifically calling out to turn off the public access to s3 buckets right? yeah like as if this is a huge issue where people just oh s3 buckets it's so easy to hook up to the web and i mean even when i moved into my place they were sharing uh condo photos through s3 buckets and you could just see the url at the top right so you knew exactly oh, what was going on you know publicly you know accessible was. Right. So, so the idea behind this one was, I mean, if to really, this is a long article, by the way, because it is a good breakdown with cartoons, you know, so this appeals to me. If you're going to be a long article, please have pictures. Uh, it was talking about how if you had access to the S3 replication service and you could use the replicate, you could continue to use. So you could, the attacker who gains control of the S3 replication services co-opting the service for evil. And using mm. its lack of logging to stay under the radar. So what's interesting about this, and from let's say my personal perspective, is that when we look for um, misconfigurations in, in say Terraform or CloudFormation, right, we're looking at certain things, and we will flag if you don't have logging on your S3 bucket. We'll also flag if you have don't have replication service. But we will, we will we will even best practice that you don't log on your application service because you have logging on the main one. Mm -hmm. 
And so some of the practices around the deployment of S3 buckets and 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 not logging replication services, because you end up with this chicken or egg where you're constantly replicating and logging, right? You can't just keep going forever. There's always going to be a point where you're not logging. And then uh, and then they're talking about how you can gain control of that. And then you can continue to monitor S3 bucket access via replication and stay under the radar. So this is kind of the kind of the played out attack there. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay. So this is a really good breakdown on silently exfiltrating data. Yeah, using the replication service. So it's not a directly uh, available, it's not an S3 bucket just wide open. That's yeah. not, it's a little bit different than that. Makes sense? Am I, am I explaining that well? Yep. If, if I'm not explaining it well, go read the cartoon. Yeah, no, I got it. Not a CVE, but definitely something if you're an AWS to uh, S3 buckets are just a huge, huge issue. It's, a, it's pretty much the it's first thing like, people people start with too, right? Right. And it's a design vulnerability. And interestingly, I was thinking like even the way we check for, you know, shift left checks would actually encourage the, the this possible attack vector. So that's kind of, I thought that was really interesting. So I'm going to read through this as well and see if there's anything that, you know, us internally, we can do to try and check for this kind of stuff to see if you've set yourself up for it. So that is an interesting sort of vulnerability, not CVE. Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that's the only thing we had though, right? So that is over to you. Yes, it is uh, cube green time and slash tool time. Is everybody All right, so this one is kind of weird because if I, uh, let me show cube green first. How do you, oh, you can't swap this over. Hold on one second. I'm going to. Oh, the share. Yeah, but unfortunately I have a big wide screen. So it's really annoying when you try to uh, share screens, you know. Mm -mm. Where is this? Here we go. This should work. All right, cube green. Let's widen this out. So that it takes up the whole screen and zoom in a bit. There we go. All right. So cube green getting started. Let's go here. An operator to reduce CO2 footprint of your clusters. Really, it's an operator that you sit there and tell it when to shrink the deployments and when to bring the deployments back up. It's honestly pretty easy to get started. What I did for the install is literally just Static configuration, make sure cert manager is installed. So I did that. Um, I'm just going to hop over real quick because I think my workloads are going to fire back up at 1050. But right now I have no pods in uh, in GKE. So you could see that all the deployments, specifically in the namespace sock shop, are at zero. Oh, can everybody see that? Yeah, I can see it. Oh, uh, yeah, bigger is better. Here you so go. you see there's cert manager, one of one. Um, and then you go down, and then there's, you know, controller manager and the load test which have not shrunk because they are not in the sock shop namespace so it's really cool that you can basically make it namespace it all has to be namespace specific but uh, again pretty easy operator just do the static configuration unless you want to use customize or the operator the olm you could do that as well i just opted for the straight install because it was easiest excuse me still getting over this sickness uh and then for configuration so I just went and took one of these examples, these sleep info resource examples. And uh, I annoyingly can't really show you because on the other screen, if you give me a second, I'll swap it. This is when you really need to have a window. Let's share that so everybody can see. Um, so yeah, so cube green. So basically I just did sleep info. We named it working hours. You can name it whatever you want. I put it around the namespace sock shop and I said, oh, it's 10.55. So uh, between 10.40 and 10.55, 10 shut it down. So it just reduced everything to zero and then starts it back up. Now, I guess the other question is, can you shrink it to one instead of zero? Maybe. I didn't see anything that was specific. I guess you can do a cluster downscale as well. So, mm. um, wow, in. really? Well, I, I'm, I'm assuming that it's not really the operator that's doing it, but it's the cloud platform that's doing it. So if you have an auto scale on and you shrink it down, then the nodes are going to shrink down too. I think it's just the, 
you want to do it across multiple namespaces, right? Yeah, I can see that. Um, here, let me bring up the docs so that we can all see this. Do, do, do. Cluster down scale. Yep. So really what it's doing is I think when you're saying sleep info, working hours, and you're not giving it a namespace, maybe it's going across the entire cluster. So if it's scaling down all the pods and you're not actually calling out a specific namespace, then yeah, it's going to shrink the cluster <laughs> pretty significantly, right? And so they're giving examples, I think, of shutting it down on the weekend here. So you're seeing memory requests and then at the min, you know, it's only at 30. The max you're getting at 73 or well it's memory limits getting all the way up to 186 there right and then during the weekend it's dropping down or the low nights are at night when you're shrinking it it's dropping down to 80 90 gigabits mm -hmm. same thing with cpu usage pods so pretty interesting i think why not use it one of the other issues though is if you're shrinking it down to zero and somebody needs to do work on a weekend and you automatically shrink it and then they have to ping you overnight and say, hey, can you bring cluster back up because you really done screwed up my project? Uh, you just got to be all these automated things. You got to make sure that yeah. everybody's on board with the timing of it, right? Yeah. All right. So what would be the, al uh, the my devil's advocate head, the alternative to this? Like, I mean, there's already ways of scaling, scaling. based on load. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I mean, you can, I, I think they, they tend to be cloud specific. I know Red Hat has one, I forget exactly what it's called, but there is an auto scaling feature functionality. It, it might actually be people at, uh, at Red Hat that maybe spin this off. I'm not completely sure about the background of it, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there's auto scalers. This, I think, just maybe has better marketing, Cube Green. <laughs> it's got, uh, it's pretty easy to set up and deploy in any cluster. I mean, I got this running in five minutes. Okay, so certainly small to medium, ease of use. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's open source, right? So yeah. Oh, nice. Pretty cool project. Yeah, and easy to demo. Yeah, super easy. Um, set I'm it up. Just, what happened? It turned it off, turned it I'm, all back on. I'm just trying to kill time right now for three more minutes until these things fire back up. But let's just see. Just to prove can... it works. Let's see if I can change it. I'm gonna move it. I'll have faith. Up. You said you said 10:55, right? So you have to wait two minutes now. <laughs> Too much. I moved it up to 10:54. Uh, I didn't want to do three because it literally <laughs> just was 10:53, and I would have screwed it up. But I don't. I, I don't know. I've never like tried to. I mean, we could. Here, let me try to change it to 53 and see if it. No, no, no. It's, it's like really, you're like you're 10 seconds off. You'll be setting it to a time in the past, essentially. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to see if that would break it. Right. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's a whole other show, isn't it? Yeah. Why not? How can we set the uh, the start time to be before the finish time? What happens? Yeah. Well, that's I a, think I think it just does fuzz probably, the inputs. It's probably just like an if and right. Like if the time is greater than or something like that, then fire it up. I don't think it specifically sits there and waits for the time. It's probably it probably yeah. goes and like just checks every minute, right? Yeah, anytime you see a DevOps tool that isn't a security tool, you just assume the inputs aren't aren't sanitized in any way. So we can probably mm -hmm. mess with it pretty bad. Good point. Well, I just changed it, so we'll see if it uh, see if it figures it out. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. There it oh, goes. Did did that pretty yep. quickly. And you're already running out of resources. Yeah. So I, I limited it to seven <laughs> nodes because I like my wallet. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you could see that. Obviously, um, I did not size my cluster properly for what the demo oh, was. Oh, who cares? That was but that being problem. said, it did scale. It scaled. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was right on. So, I mean, you could change it on the fly if you want. I just did a kubectl edit and just moved it up a couple minutes. All right. Uh, nice one. Yeah. All right. So, there you go. Those of you out there looking to save some money. It's like uh, when you put your washing <laughs> machine on at 2 in the morning because the electricity is cheaper. Yeah, it is pretty good though because uh, when I was trying it out this morning, just getting it all set up, I put the node auto scaling between three and seven, and I said yeah. it doesn't auto scale right away, right? Just so people know, the auto scale has to be at minimum resources. I think for like 15, 20 minutes, thirty minutes. I right. forget what the, you can change the timing on it, but uh, I put it to zero for a good hour, and then it scaled down to three, right, automatically. Oh, so okay. it is. It's 
pretty useful in that sense where if you can tie it up with the cloud resources, it's pretty effective. Mm. Sounds good. Sweet. I like it. Yeah, successful demo. Uh, yeah, that was an easy one. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's going to be a harder one next time. Yeah, speaking of next time, possible next week, Friday, same time, 10 a.m. That's possible. We'll see how hungover Steve is. Could be for a great show. Yeah, but uh, we'll post about it on LinkedIn. And if you want to get notifications next time, hit that little subscribe and bell button. If you hit that bell button, you get notified every time we go live, which would be sweet. Um, which we want. Yeah, and I, like I said, I have a little 30-minute notification, so I'm not late. So it's awesome. <laughs> well done. Uh, otherwise... That's the end of the show. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Once again, my name is Steve Jaguar. And I'm Mike Foster. Happy Friday.